so thrilled to have you here. I'm Deborah Polsky. I'm the Executive Director of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. And we are so excited about tonight's lecture, Tracking David Stone. First, I'd like to uh, thank the Andrus family who are here with us, uh, a few of them anyway, um, and their support is immeasurable to the Historical Society and particular, particularly for this lecture series. Our speaker, Karen Franklin, is director of the Family Research Project at the Leo Beck Institute in New York, co-chair of the Board of Governors of JewishGen.org, a past president of the International Association of Jewish Genealogical Societies and past chair of the Council of American Jewish Museums, she's currently chair of the Memorial Museums Committee of the International Council of Museums. Clearly a woman who doesn't know how to say no. <laughs> she serves on the advisory board of the European Shoah Legacy Institute and is vice president of the Obermeyer German Jewish History Award. In her spare time, she acts as a proofreader for Southern Jewish History, which is the journal of the Southern Jewish Historical Society. Karen has given recent lectures um, a, a lot of places, but particularly to the Association of European Jewish Museums, the Union of Reform Judaism Biennial, as a scholar in residence in Walnut Creek, California, the Long Island Jewish Genealogical Society, which is where we saw a blurb that got us interested, and uh, the Scholars Conference on the Holocaust in Los Angeles. Um, in addition to seeing this little write-up in the law from the Los Angeles Genealogical Society, um, I got a call from Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman, a, our local pediatric dentist, who said, Having some family research done, and we discovered that uh, somebody in our family was a bank robber in Frost, Texas. Would you be interested in finding out more about it and maybe doing a program? And I said, that's amazing, because I just read this article, and it's on my list of people to call. So um, we were thrilled to not only bring in Karen and hear this wonderful story, but to know that there's a local connection and to be part of um, the wonderful things that are kind of happening around this story that we, you'll hear about from Karen. So I want to thank you in advance for coming. Um, Karen will do her presentation. We'll save some time for questions and answers. And um, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening. I don't usually begin with the thank yous, but I also need to begin with the thank yous tonight to Deborah, who really um, did a wonderful job organizing this evening. Thank you, and really got it when it comes to the concept and the moving story of David Stone. To my patron, client, and good friend, Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman, who also spirited this entire project, as you will see, to my husband, Stephen, who accompanied me and who will be leading the memorial service tomorrow morning for David Stone. Um, this is one of the most complicated lectures I have ever given, actually. It, it's funny, it's sad, but it's really difficult, and I'll tell you why. I come from the museum profession, and we always say when we're curating an exhibition that you have to think about the person who comes in to see the exhibit because every person who walks in sees a different thing when they see an object. So just imagine that you are coming into an exhibition of a jeweled tiara and who are the people who are going to come see this on display in an exhibition? So the wealthy wife is going to come in and say, that's really beautiful. Where can I buy one? <laughs> and the husband's going to come in and he's going to say, that's a beautiful tiara. How much is my wife going to make me pay for something like that? And the artist is going to come in and say, that's really beautiful. How can I make one like that? And the thief is going to come in and say, you know what the thief is going to say. Okay. And 
I'm going to walk in and say, that's really lovely, but that is the worst label I have ever seen. So that's what a, mu a museum person. So now think of this story. This is the story of a Jewish bank robber. It's amazing and funny because it's unusual, because no one ever discovered it. Um, the people in Frost, Texas are just enthralled for 80 <coughs> years with this story. Frost, does anyone know where Frost, Texas is? <laughs> Neither do I. But I think it's somewhere about an hour and a half south of here, direct south. Frost had a population of 400 and some in 1935 when the bank was robbed, and now it has risen to a total of 662 <laughs> people. And, and uh, when I called the fellow, uh, when I emailed the guy uh, last night and said, yikes, I said, we haven't spoken about where we're going to meet tomorrow morning. Should we make plans? I got an email the likes of which I've never gotten in my whole life. He said, he said, honey, and they don't call me honey in New York all that much. He said, <laughs> honey, he said, Frost is a teeny weeny town. You won't get lost. So this was the town that David Stone walked into 80 years ago. And this is the story that this town is the most exciting thing that's ever happened in this town. I thought that was the case. And when I spoke to this guy, he said, you know, this is the most exciting thing that ever happened in this town. <laughs> So for the people in Frost, the story is the story of this bank robbery. It's the story of this Pierce Arrow car that came with this load full of bank robbers, unloaded them, and you know the whole thing that unfolded, and it's the same story for 80 years, until tonight, and until tomorrow, all of a sudden the story changes for them. And I got my rude awakening. Um, actually, when Deborah published one of your programs a few, a few days ago, and this guy in, in Frost wrote me and he said, you have some of your facts wrong. And I was so taken aback, and, and, and okay, that, that could be possible. And, and he said, uh, apparently, that the robbery didn't actually take place inside the bank. It took place in front of the bank, and David Stone shot, he said, stick them up, and he shot the, um, the actual night watchman three times in the, ha in the hands. And the night watchman said, I don't do that for nobody, and shot him back straight through the heart. And I said to myself, I am the museum curator, because I was just looking at the label. And I wasn't looking at the whole story, because the story didn't matter to me. What mattered was that he was a Jewish boy, that I tracked him down, that I found his cousins, that it was a sad story. But the robbery itself was really of little consequence to me. So I wasn't looking with my eyes until I came down here and really saw what the bank robbery was all about. So with that in mind, I'll show you the story. Now you understand why it's so complicated for me to tell the story, because I don't want to go in all these directions, but I'm sure you'll see all of this now in all of the slides, and I hope that when it comes time for the questions in the end, that you may uh, recognize this complexity and feel free to ask me on any part of what they may be. So this is Tracking David Stone. <clears throat> so the story began when uh, my client and friend, Dr. Jeffrey Hoffman, uh, asked me to trace his family tree and he sent me a lot of research he had already done. And he, when he sent me the database, Oh, you killed it. Just kidding. Is there one on the next one? Seriously. I have another copy, so you don't have to worry. I hate technology. <laughs> okay. Well, he sent me this, this um, family tree, and it said, apparently, something like, apparently I had a cousin who was killed in a bank robbery. His name was David Stone, and it happened in Texas. Well, I don't know how many Google or how many of you Google well, but if you try Googling David Stone, Texas, you don't get a lot, and you don't get a bank robbery in Frost, Texas in 1935. It doesn't happen that easily. It took me a very long time to figure out the details of David Stone in Frost, Texas. And when I did, I'll just tell you a, a little ahead of time, part of the story is 
imagine now it's the um, Jewish historians walking into that exhibition. When I first found out this story, I wrote to some of the famous Jewish historians, Southern Jewish historian, historians of the South, and I wrote to them and I said, I didn't think I'd really discovered anything. How could I possibly have discovered something? And I said, what do you know about David Stone, the Jewish bank robber of Frost, Texas? And they wrote me back and they said, we would have known about it already if there had been a Jewish bank robber in Frost, Texas. You couldn't possibly have discovered anything. We getting there? Yeah. Cool. There we go. There we go. So, all right. Next page. Oh, but that's the. Um, can we do the play of the show? We can do it this way, but I can I can do it this way. Just to see that I'm not really a good person at setting up. What did you want me? No, if you play the show, it's not going to show all the stuff in the back. It's like a Microsoft copy where you can I see the little fuzzy letters, the red under the fuzzy letters. And if you play the show, it comes. If you can see it, that's, that's fine. So, uh, oh, I think I've got it. So I just wanted to, to show you that when I, when I finally thought for the program, I said, oh, well, I'll just show how difficult it is to do David Stone bank robbery. I put it in, but by then I had already given a lecture on Long Island, so when I put in David Stone bank robbery, it came up with my lecture, so that wasn't very helpful to show you. About it. Okay. This is the actual death certificate for David Stone, which I already uh, received when, when I put this together, and I just wanted to, to show it to you, because it, it, as a document, it itself is very moving. He was born in Michigan, which he was not. They really didn't know. The people who put it together, they put it together in Texas. They knew he came from Michigan. They knew nothing about him. Birthplace, maiden name, the parents, everything was unknown. The only thing that was known was that if you go a little closer, I'm sorry. It says it was a homicide in Frost, Texas, in a public place shot by the night watchman, bullet wound through, sent through the center of the chest. That's how he died. So this is the um, family tree program that we use, and Jeffrey had said apparently shot during a holdup in Texas. But that's what I had, not even a bank robbery, it was a holdup. Okay. Well, he did say stick him up. We didn't know that then. And this is the family. Um, I have various amounts of information at, at different times. His father's name was not actually Stone. The original name was Stahl. It was changed uh, from Stone. The, the family story is that we learned. He, he, David was the oldest of seven children. There actually were eventually eight. Um, they were actually, David was born in England. His parents, his mother came from Mania. His father came from Austria. They married in England, had David, and then came over to the United States and had a number more children. <coughs> now, when we started our uh, journey together, Jeffrey knew the names of the children, and he had a photograph of the family in about 1920. And it was a complete mystery as to what happened to this family. After 1920, they vanished. It was just one little recoll recollection of one branch of the family, and that was it. So we went to Jewish Gen, a genealogy website. We went to the passenger records on Ellis Island. <coughs> we searched them, and we found David, Rebecca Stahl, Rebecca Stone, David's mother. On here, she was from Bacau, from Romania. And here is David Stone at the age of two. Two. two, coming over, um, born in England, coming to the United States in 1907. And of course, um, Jewish Gen has a little map so you can see where Bacau, I hope I'm pronouncing it properly, is in Romania. So that was his family background. And I put in uh, Rebecca Stone, born in Romania, into Ancestry.com, another very well used, I'm sure if you've watched these various genealogy programs on TV, 
You know, I put the names in to see what I would come up with. And there were some interesting things. I found that 1920 census, a 1910 census, and then again, I didn't find anything later. But let's take a look at what I did find from 1920, before the family connection got cut off. This Rebecca Stone and um, Dr. Hoffman's great-grandfather and Rebecca Stone were brother and sister. So that was the connection. So if you think back in your own families to your great-grandparents and their sisters and brothers, and if you know all the descendants, that's where it gets a little tricky. So here was the 1920 census, and we had William Stone and Rebecca Stone, the husband and wife, came over in, 19, uh, in 1905, we know it's actually 1907, Austria, Romania, and England, and then all the other siblings born in New York. They were in Huntington, Long Island. And the father was a baker. That was his trade. Now, after 1920, <coughs> clueless could not find them, and that was the question, what happened to them? So, now we're going to skip ahead. <laughs> we're going to get to the middle later and tell you about Frost, Texas in 1935. And we call him Shana Putnam Stone. That's what one of those arrogant Southern Jewish historical uh, professors called him in a lighter moment, Shana Putnam Stone. So this is where Frost, Texas is. Uh, and I'm sure you know the map quite better than I, Dallas, and just directly south. This is what it looked like in about 1930. Um, not a lot. There was a major uh, hurricane in 1930, so a number of photos were taken at that time. That's what the uh, damage in downtown Frost was in the 1930 tornado. But if you look very carefully, you'll see the central area was destroyed, and there's a lot of debris around there, but there wasn't a lot there before the hurricane to be destroyed. Was it a tornado? Tornado. Tornado. I'm sorry, tornado. Thank you. And this is Citizens State Bank, the bank outside of which we know that David Stone was shot. Now, the newspaper reports, Frost seen a gun battle. An unidentified man about 35 is dead. The night watchman was ordered to stick up his hands by the slain man, and Melton's answer was, I don't do that for anybody. Of course you can't. And then there's a series of articles, which you can actually read much more easily on the Corsicana uh, library website than in the originals, but uh, officers arrest man in connection with Frost gun battle. A man, officers say, has admitted to being in Frost the night Will Melton, <coughs> night watchman, was seriously wounded and David Stone was slain, blah, 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 blah. And it continues. <coughs> I'm sorry? They said it was from Dallas. From Dallas. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, uh, we'll get to that if I don't. <coughs> Hundreds of Frost and Navarro County citizens and officers from surrounding counties, including Waco, have viewed the body in a fetal attempt to identify the man. That was slightly earlier, but you have to ask, how did they figure out who he was? They shot him dead, then they didn't know who he was. <laughs> Identification of slain man uh, has been established, and the way they established it was... <coughs> well, uh, first, okay. Now that's okay, I was in the wrong order. Before that, just take a step back. They didn't know who he was, they figured it out in the back, in the next slide, but they notified the family, and this is where the story becomes very moving and where you begin to understand the social history, the part that was missing in the Frost bank robber story, and that is that they notified a sister in Washington, that's I believe Washington State, not Washington, D.C., and she said they couldn't, she couldn't take the body. It was 1935, this was the heart of the Depression. And in fact, what we learned later, and, and mm -hmm. the point of all this is that we discovered another cousin, a woman who, her name is Barbara Schwartz. She was the niece 
She is the niece of David Stone. She lives in Oklahoma. And she remembers very well the whole story of David Stone, although she never knew what happened to him. Because she was 11 months old when David Stone was shot, and they called her mother, too. And they said, can we send you the body? And her mother said, I have a baby. I can't afford the body. I can't take it. And her mother never really knew what happened afterwards. And Barbara never knew what happened to her uncle David Stone until we did our research. So now this is how they found out who he was. He had a tattoo on his back because he had served in the Marines. So they were able to make his, get his fingerprints and connect it with Washington and make the <coughs> identification. They were dispatched to the War Department. You can imagine, by the way, I no wonder why this was a lasting legend in Frost, Texas. This must have been really exciting in 1935. <laughs> I went on Ancestry.com and I went to look for David Stone's military records to see exactly what he was doing in the military that they found his fingerprints. And lo and behold, we found that David H. Stone, he served actually from 1923 to 1927. This was the first time at the time I was doing the research that I knew what happened to all these stones after 1920, because remember I was somewhat stymied. Um, he was a trumpeter. Now, after all, what else would a good Jewish boy be doing in the <laughs> Marines but playing the trumpet? He was the guy that played bugle in the morning. It's, it's kind of amazing. And he did it for four years, except for when he went to rifle range practice, which is another topic which we'll leave aside. And there it says he's under instruction to learn drum and trumpet. And it gives a list. This is actually rather interesting. I don't really know, I, I'm making a joke of it, I'm presuming that he played taps in regular, what's the right, regularly? Regular? Right, in the morning, I don't know for sure. But it's not like they listed the bands, you know, the trombones and the flutes and everything. Here was the um, sergeant, the, the, the something sergeants, the sergeants, the corporals, private first class, then the trumpeter, and then the privates on the list. Uh, yep. Now, so how did I figure out and put it together? I actually, there is one elderly person from, I better be careful in this audience, in every audience. There was a cousin who um, was of the older cousins of the generation in uh, Jeffrey's family, who, gave, who didn't remember much at all, but he remembered one thing. That was that the family went to Michigan that this Stone family moved out to Michigan, and that William Stone, who was that baker, brought bagels to Detroit. And that was the little clue that I needed. And Jeffrey had also remembered the one branch of that family that he knew was that there was a Barbara who married Stan Schwartz, and who was the daughter of Ethel. So with that information at in Michigan, I went to look she was Ethel Stone, married by the name of the Farber, blah, blah, and had a daughter who married Stan Schwartz. And now I could take a look, if I had to look how many Stan Schwartzes there are in the United States, and how many Barber Schwartzes there are, not knowing where they lived, I never, or Ethel Schwartzes or Ethel Farbers. But here I found a death record of an Ethel Farber who had a social security record that was issued in Michigan. And that's what put it together. And then this was from Oklahoma City. She died in Oklahoma City. So then I went to the Oklahoma telephone records and I found Stanley Schwartz and his wife, Barbara. I had found them, I found the cousins. Now, Jeffrey's family did know them, but they hadn't been in touch for almost 30 years. And they were able to make the connection. And it was Barbara who told us what we now know of the details of her uncle, David Stone. So the, she told us the story that I'm going to tell you now that's very personal, that some of you may know from some of the publicity, very painful, very personal, but it's looking at that museum exhibit in a different way. 
Barbara told the story that the father, Barbara's grandfather, uh, Barbara's grandfather was a very, very strong, difficult man and abusive. And when, Bar when his wife, Rebecca, was pregnant with her ninth child that, who she, that she didn't want, she tried to self-abort. What we didn't know until three days ago, uh, and it's a very painful story, was that she actually did this by poison and was successful and was witnessed by her children. And it, it's, this is the social history that goes with the actual history that the people in Frost, Texas don't know, that make us ask the questions, well, these weren't the wealthy peddlers who, you know, then bought the department store. This was the rest of the United States. These were Jews who were just regular people who didn't make it, who didn't have the financial wherewithal, a broken family, a child who didn't have the money, who had to rub a bank <coughs> to make a go of it with a broken family. Went into the Marines, 19, now we're putting it together, went into the Marines 1923 to 1927. And then what happened to him? Let's see. We looked for Rebecca, by the way. There's wonderful uh, records in Michigan, cemetery records. We never found her grave. 1930, the family, the children were broken up, sent into separate homes after their mother died. Someone up to, to Boston with an aunt, another into Detroit with an aunt, all over. And we see in 1930, this Anna, who the body was not shipped to, at the age of um, 19, 18, 13, and 10, they were living by themselves in 1930. And of course, David Stone would have at the time been 25. Um, now, the interesting part, when the historian said to me, can you prove that David Stone was Jewish? It was an important question because this family was Jewish when they came over, but did they stay Jewish after the mother died? How can you show? How do we know? How do we know he didn't just convert? And I found uh, David Stone's 1930 census record. And usually with census records, with such a common name, uh, you have to look at people together, look for Rebecca and William, look for Anna and, and David. But I didn't, and here's David Stone all by himself. It's David Stone, and I it was very hard to find it because I don't know how you can see from there, but it was indexed as Daniel Stone because it looks more like Daniel than David. And here he is. His uh, his he was born in England, and and is it said he's a soldier? Is that the I'm sorry. <coughs> oh, um, well here it says, I'm not exactly sure, but he was born in England, his mother was born in Romania, it, it was a mistake, I guess, and his father was born in England, but he was Jewish. He self-identifies himself as Jewish in 1930. He's listed with 20 single lodgers, uh, working men who are, I don't know, in some kind of a hostel or something. And he's the only one in the whole list who lists himself as Jewish in 1930. So, services were conducted by Reverend Pittman, pastor of the Methodist Church in Frost, because the people in Frost never knew that David Stone was Jewish. He was Jewish in 1930, but when the sister couldn't take the body, both sisters couldn't take the body, they gave no indication in Frost that he was Jewish, and so he was buried in an unidentified plot in Frost, Texas, in the cemetery. This is the photo I found online. I think it's uh, not a very recent one, because uh, this is what it looks like today, I believe. Now what we found when we decided that we wanted to rectify after all these years and put up a stone for David Stone, a Jewish stone, and honor his memory, um, realizing that the identity of this 
evil villain of Frost, Texas, we see him much differently than the bank robber that they see him as. We see him with, I think, some mercy and understanding as a very uh, misguided young man with no family to fall back upon. Um, we called the people in Frost and they said, you know, we have a stone. We put up stones. We have a cemetery committee. We put up stones for a list of the names of all the people who were buried in unmarked graves. And each one has a stone. But we didn't know anything about David, so we only have his death date. And so we asked them, could you add to his stone his birth date, which we found for them, and a Magen David. And they did. And this is what we will do tomorrow. We will give David Stone a memorial service. Whether he wants it or not. And his, yeah, his, um, his niece, who was 11 months old at the time, whose mother could not bury him properly because of her, uh, there's closure to the story for her that the brother can now be buried properly. And we only have um, one sentence from the time of what David Stone was like, who we know. Wouldn't it be nice to know who he was to have a better sense? In 1993, my sister Anne, who lived in Washington, wrote to Barbara and told her the whole family history. Just terribly sad and, and much more painful than some of the details I told you. And she talked about every brother and sister of those nine or eight or seven children. And there was only one line about David Stone, which was really interesting because she gave no indication. She could have, it's 1993, she spoke nothing of the bank robbery at all whatsoever. She only had this statement about David. David, when I met him in Washington, seemed like a nice, gentle person. And that is the boy who we will be memorializing tomorrow. This is the only photo that we know of of David. This is his mother and his father, who is, I'm sorry it's such a poor photo, but if you take a look close up, the man seems like a starker. He seems like he could be uh, a very difficult person. And David is the one at the top, the oldest son. That's David Stone. Oh, who were the bank robbers? You know, that's a really good question. So now I will tell you another story. It, it's part of that, you know, I, I came into the um, jewelry exhibition as a curator, and so someone asked me just a few weeks ago what happened to the other bank robbers. And I had never looked because I wasn't looking for the bank robbers. I was looking for David Stone. So I actually went, and please, oh, it's actually on tape, so... I, it goes not out of this room and not off this tape, but I actually looked to find what happened to the other bank robbers. And I discovered, I figured out that there was a son of one of the other bank robbers who lives in this general area. And I thought for historical purposes it would be important to know. Did he have documents? Could he tell us stories about this? Maybe he could fill us in on what happened in this bank robbery. So with great trepidation, about 10 days ago, I called his home, I knew it was the right person, and I said, um, I'm really embarrassed to call you, I hope you'll forgive me for calling you out of the blue, and please, you know, I'm very sorry if this catches you unaware, but did you know your father was a bank robber? <laughs> and he said, uh, well, when was this? And I said, it was 1935, and he said, well, gee, I was born in 1942, and he never told me about it. <laughs> uh, and it was very painful. I mean, I'm sure it was very painful for him. Uh, I'm sure his father did never tell him. I think in that particular case, he wasn't actually present at the robbery. He was later 
um, uh, accused of being part of the gang that had planned it. Whether he had sort of prison time, I, I didn't find out. Um, but I told the man that I would not contact him again. Obviously, my only purpose was in seeing if he had additional information for historical purposes, not to track him down as well. So, um, but other, and I did look up the others. Some continued in a life of crime. Others did not. But um, I don't know more. I mean, one would have to really be a historian and go and interview people uh, to know more about them. Maybe we'll find out more when we're in Frost tomorrow. What could happen? Wouldn't you be curious to know Melton sounds like a Jew, possibly a Jewish name. So wouldn't you be curious to know who Melton was, or if this was a robbery like totally at random, or how many banks were in Frost, <coughs> and was this a robbery totally at random, or maybe there was some kind of a connection that made Stone seek out Melton. Do you need a job? <laughs> but, 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 you know, I a research assistant. No, but no. when I watch the detective shows, <laughs> they, they want to know if there's some connection or something linking uh, the people, somebody who perpetrates a crime versus, you know, someone who is perpetrated against, if they're, what the connection might be. And then the other thing I would be curious about, how big, how, were there other Jews and congregations in their town? No. 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 There, there were, um, the closest community that I know of would have been Dallas, itself. No, 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 the major communities. The, we, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't. I know, I know there were many smaller communities. But I know that he, the articles did say that he had lived in Dallas prior. And one of them even said that he had married. So it could be, we don't know anything about that. A wife was never mentioned in any of the articles. No wife stepped forward. Um, maybe he had children. I think it's unlikely. But one never knows. As far as the night watchman, Willie Melton, we got a message from this Danny Gillespie, this wonderful historian of the town of Frost, uh, who, who uh, called me honey. And uh, he said that the Melton name is a very uh, important family in Frost, Texas, and that Meltons will be uh, present at the funeral tomorrow. And uh, Barbara wrote an apology to be read to the Melton family at the funeral. You can find out if any of them are Jewish or have a Jewish connection. Yeah, I think it's not a it's not a Jewish family. I, I know Melton is an important name, important yeah, name in Jewish education. They came in 1899. They found they actually founded the town. In the 1899. Yeah, it was a trading stop. You know, like because the railroad came mm -hmm. through was why how the actual city finally got started. But um, yeah, they were the, like one of the earliest families. That, Right. Thank you. But in terms of the question also of the um, this particular gang and other gangs and, and how they selected that town and so on and so forth, I didn't study it because it wasn't the area that I was interested in. I'm sure there is information that we'll learn for us tomorrow. Yeah. So I'll, Deborah will be able to tell you next time you come here all the details. Is yes. there going to be a rabbi at this? Um, well, my husband, I, I, I imported one from New York to do the service. It's my husband, Rabbi okay. Stephen Franklin. So it will be done well and properly with dignity. I also read something that said initially, like they knew he was from Dallas early on, but and they thought that he had been like a, somebody was a sewing machine salesman or something like that. Was that him or was that one of the other... No, he apparently yeah, he sped out of town. It's a really interesting question. Apparently, he had some sort of card in his pocket, like a business card, that said he was a sewing machine salesman or something from Michigan. And since we know he had lived in Michigan, it's very possible that at some time he had um, been one. But also, it, when we trace where he was between 1927 and 1935, that's a lot of years. When he left the military. When he got his honorable discharge, he, he said he was going to, I think, Trenton, New Jersey. And then in 1930, we see him in Philadelphia. 
And then Anne writes in her letter that she saw him in Washington, which I'm presuming since she was traveling at the time to her family in the East, it meant Washington, D.C. So somehow he was making his way down to Dallas, because you have to ask who was in Dallas, why did he come down to Dallas? There wasn't anybody in the family in Dallas. So it's somewhat unknown. What was the question? Yeah, the, the, the Michigan. The city. Yeah. Other questions? Was there any other bank robbery somehow connected to him? What was that his introduction to the business? <laughs> was that his introduction to the business? Well, you know, that's a really good question because it could be that he robbed others and no one ever found out. But as far as I know, this was certainly the only one they discovered. And one doesn't know, uh, again, there could have been other crimes that he committed between 1930 and 1935 that weren't necessarily bank robberies, but could have been other crimes. So that's a really good question. Yeah. Were any of the other gang members Jewish? Not that we know of. How many were there? I think there were four or five that acted in different capacities. One of them was really a bad guy. There was a record of him committing robberies and other um, problems with him, assaults and everything, before and after. Uh, the others didn't have such extensive records. Were they, were they from Dallas or? They were from Waco and various towns around. But you know, John Dillinger was very active in this area during that time period. That's also a year of and Bonnie and Clyde, right? Of course. Yeah. Um, <coughs> apparently, you know the names of the other robbers that were, or the gang that was with him. Apparently, that's known. <coughs> and they must not have known that he was Jewish, or they didn't say that he was when it came time to bury him. And, really and it's interesting that the town went to such lengths to find relatives, one sister here, one sister there, and then you know, gave him a pauper's burial, which is appropriate. Nobody else would claim the body. But they actually went to some effort to find, mm -hmm. even though he <laughs> had shot someone of the town mm -hmm. and was trying to rob them. Yeah, those are really Southern good Southern hospitality. <laughs> those know. are really good points, and, and especially the question of, did the other bank robbers know he was Jewish? And were they going to give it up? Um, yeah, and how long did he know them for? And did he commit other crimes with them? Did they get arrested? Yeah. I think it's interesting that even after speaking with the other family members, the family members of the family yeah, said, yeah. didn't mention the fact that he was Jewish either. Sure. So I was just saying I think it's interesting that even in tough, when they spoke, when, he, when the authorities spoke with the family members, that the family members didn't mention he was Jewish. Well, but it never came out. I mean, it's, well, it's odd. Karen, 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 tell them about Barbara as a member of David Peckman's congregation in Oklahoma. Well, no, but she means at the time, at the time that um, that they called in 1935 and I said, see. "Is that what you mean?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. That they didn't. They didn't say we want a Jewish burial. So that's I mean, <laughs> that's a really fraught question. I mean, uh, did did they not want to because they were embarrassed, or did they figure out that? It wasn't going to happen anyway. There was no Jewish cemetery, so it didn't matter. Um, and I guess we can never know that. Maybe they didn't even know that they Which, were going to bury him. Right, and it, it makes it very even that much more tragic, particularly because we know that Barbara's mother was um, a practicing Jew, and it was important to her. Some of the other siblings did not remain Jewish. They had no childhood to remember of a, a home where Judaism was practiced. But um, but Barbara's mother did and was, and she was also one who said, no, I can't. So. Do we know, and do you know anything else about, so Jeff is related on the mother's, on David Stone's mother's mm -hmm. side. Did you learn anything else about her side of the family? Did other people come over? 
from Romania? Did she have siblings that came to America? Or Actually, like Jeff can answer that question. I think another question that's implied here is about uh, closer relations, which is the, the Stone side and the father side. And there were other stones in Michigan. And, and I actually don't know. There are some there stalls stones. here in Dallas. And some stones. Uh, they, don't tell them about the lecture, OK? So, <laughs> Yeah. Crazy. Very interesting. Jeff, do you want to talk? Well, uh, Rebecca Solomon had, uh, her brother was my great-grandfather, and there were other sisters and some half-sisters. Um, the, uh, m most of them stayed in Manchester, never came to America. Um, I did meet one of the descendants of one of the sisters at my bar mitzvah. <laughs> but um, I've tried to contact the family in Manchester, and they are not interested in keeping uh, any kind of contact with me. Yeah, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of support outside the immediate family, which which would have been wonderful. And actually, I I would read because this is really an important part of the story, and the sister um, who you recall from a letter wrote to Barbara in 1993 telling the story, and she wrote, um, she was talking about when the children were broken up after their mother died. She wrote, at one point, two sisters, one near Detroit and the other near Boston, Massachusetts, proposed to father that they would be happy to have, quote, foster daughters. Ethel was taken in near Detroit. I was shipped off to Boston. When it became painfully obvious that these two ladies had reverted to the days when children were taken from the workhouse of old and in exchange for labor they provided board I notified father to send return fare which he wished he furnished promptly can you imagine his anger uh, and his daughters being deemed servants so this was the larger family net that he had, that those children had, uh, to take care of them after <coughs> mother's death. It's pretty sad. What did you? What word did you use? Uh, he was upset that his children were what? So well, after after the wife died, then the children were sent off to all these various family members who treated them badly. So that was probably in the early 1920s. The, the word you used. So the word with a D? What word do you use? Word you use? Like the word you use. Dienst. D-I-E-N-S-T. It's German. Yeah. Like Diener. Oh. Gedenk Diener. So, uh, yeah, servant. <coughs> I, I thank you for your interest and, and opportunity. I'm giving you some Thank you so much for coming. We um, would like to make a couple of other introductions while we're here. Jim Schwartz, our president of our board of directors, who normally does this, but he allowed me the pleasure of standing in front of you tonight. And as well as the chair of our upcoming uh, Ann Secor Humanitarian Award Luncheon, Barbara Lee, she's a co-chair, along with Andrea Weinstein. And that will be April 16th, by the way, luncheon. Mark your calendars now. It's going to be fabulous. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this evening, as you often enjoy the Anders Family Lecture Series, and that if you are not already a member of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society, that you'll consider becoming one. Um, there are little things on your chairs and certainly by the front and we have also books and videos for sale. Thank you again for coming and uh, enjoy your evening.